if I could start things off, your show is Tommy Tiernan's show. Every week, yeah. you have no idea who the guests are going to be. You have no prep, no heads up. And if I was no. to put you in that position now, where you came on and a host didn't know you, how would you introduce yeah. yourself? Oh, how would I introduce myself? That's a great question. I, uh, oh, Jesus. <laughs> See, any time you define yourself, you always feel as if it's too uh, limited a notion. Mm. Oh, God. Uh, a very talented uh, teenage pool player. That's how I would describe it. <laughs> and am I right in saying this, that you are actually colorblind? Yes, I am, yeah. So does that affect so I the can't playing? Close, yeah, so there'll be times, uh, I, one, one of my kind of um, insecurities is mistaking the brown for one of the reds. Uh, so that's, that's the spectrum that I'm on. <laughs> so I, uh, I... My wife actually bought me, it's not these glasses now, but you can get these glasses that, uh, for colorblind people, that, that fix all the colors in the world. And there's videos of them online, of these guys on the veranda of some house in Wisconsin or something. And the whole family gathers around and he's colorblind and he gets the glasses and he starts, <laughs> it's so emotional that he can see all these colors. So my wife bought me a pair of them, you know, thinking it was going to, Change. It just made everything green. <laughs> just, everything was just green. So, See, but I am colorblind. I'm also a, tone deaf, and oh I have my. flat feet. Wow! What a the, the triple trash there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I should have. I probably should have gone to a special needs school, <laughs> but they decided to send me to St. Pat's in Navan anyway. <laughs> you might think of there is like, how do you know when to put out the green bin? That's why I always wonder with people that are colorblind. How do you know what bin goes out that week? I don't actually. Uh, I yeah. As far as I'm concerned, we have two brown bins. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I, just, I, I leave both of them out. So. <laughs> Whichever which, which one is empty, just grand with me. <laughs> so I um, just get back. I've really been enjoying the podcast. And I've just been wondering, Thank how you. have you been coping in lockdown? You've been finding it. Did the, did the podcast come from a, was it born from a place of wanting to stay creative during lockdown? Or is it something you always wanted to do? No, it was, it was, um, uh, all of us end up doing doing jobs, I suppose, that, um, I, is, how do you describe this now, that uh, maybe we're very responsible and maybe we're kind of just copping on and like my, fa my father's attitude to work was it doesn't matter what it is, you're and, and and get enough money to pay your bills, you know. But I, I must have been watching something on telly where some guy was reminiscing about his life and he, he said that he had a lot of fun, that he didn't care how successful he was or just had a lot of fun. And that really struck a chord with me. And I was wondering how much of my life can I look back on and say, that was awful crack, you know? And there wasn't a fierce amount. Now, I've done stuff that's successful, but success isn't the same as crack, you know? Um, and I said, okay, well, uh, let's let's try and do something that's just pure fun and the thing that came into my head immediately was working with Hector and Larita um, I just have such, such a laugh with them like Hector makes me laugh in a way it hasn't happened since I was in secondary school so um, um, I just I just I phoned the pair of them up and they both said yeah so mm. that was it so and I know that. you mentioned on the podcast that you couldn't cut your hair because you're going back to film and Derry Girls again oh look at it there now it's growing <laughs> Is there a date set for, <laughs> for what? For the haircut? Or, or no, for returning to filming? Is there a date yet set? Or <laughs> um, no, for Dairy Girls, no. Um, there's nothing. So oh, this, I hate it. It's just I don't hate it. It's just very seventies. <laughs> very, very agricultural advisor now in the nineteen. <laughs> well, I think oh. you're onto. You, I know you. You said Bill Murray is a bit of a you know hair hero now. I think that's a good look. Absolutely. <laughs> You're the first person to say that to me. <laughs> <laughs> With Derry Girl, um, I've yeah. always wondered, was it your own choice to not do a Derry accent or would you ever consider doing the Derry accent? I suggest, see, on, on the, re the read-through, I would have done loads and loads of gigs up north, you know, and um, Northern Republicans do have uh, a kind of thing towards Southerners that the Southerners kind of let them down, you know, that the Southerners abandoned them. Um, and 
I did a, did a read through of the script, and so the the when I saw that the granddad hates the dad, I just said to Lisa, "Look, I said if the dad was from the south, it would add an extra level there." And she said, "Absolutely, let's give it a go." And then then I try now. My Derry accent is very similar to my Pakistani accent, so I guess they decided for just for continuity purposes that they keep me Southern Irish. <laughs> so speaking of dairy and places in Ireland, we're kind of encouraged now with COVID to staycation and travel mm. in Ireland. Navin, is that a place you would recommend as a staycation location or how would you sell someone to travel and visit Navin now in Ireland? Well, I love going back to the town. Um, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't get out of the car or anything, but I do <laughs> like... <laughs> Quite true, as always. Uh, I've been I've been doing a lot of driving from Galway up to Belfast, you know, and um, I always make a point of driving through Navan and uh, uh, kind of driving down as many different streets as I can and looping back on myself and calling into the Valley Cafe and getting a bag of chips and then driving the car up to the car park outside St Oliver Plunkett's Church, um, and um eating the chips there and then driving through Clusker Park and Black Castle and out the Slane Road. Um, so how would I sell Navin? I, I, you couldn't buy it. <laughs> you wouldn't want you'd it. Sell it. You, wouldn't, you couldn't buy it. You wouldn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Hector so, said he prefers the chips at SEO's Valley Cafe all the way. <laughs> SEO's. I wouldn't go, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even go in there for directions. I don't mind chips. <laughs> So since lockdown has kind of happened and COVID, we've seen the arts industry mm. and comedians in particular affected. I know yourself, you've had to reschedule a lot of gigs and how has it affected yourself or how do you feel it's going to affect the future of comedy or the arts industry? Um, I don't know. I mean, I signed a letter today asking for some um, that came from the entertainment industry, people just asking for governmental help because the amount of people, they said, you know, the entertainment sector was the first one to go and it'll be the last one back. Um, and you have, they said, the guts of 35,000 people um, who have no way of earning any money. And not only do they not have a way of earning money, but the work that they do provides billions for people in other industries. So the hospitality sector mainly, you know. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen. I do know that I found, I've kind of come out of it in the, in the last week, but I've found the last five or six weeks incredibly difficult. Uh, and I just noticed in myself that I'm not getting physically what I need. And I was trying to identify, well, what, what is it? First of all, I've, I've noticed I was in a bad mood. And my energy levels went through the floor. I just had no, there's no buzz in me at all. And I was trying to, what the hell is happening here? Because I'd meet somebody and while I'm talking to them, the energy be up. And as soon as they go, oh man, I'd be on the floor again, you know? So I did about five weeks of that and it's not to be recommended and it's hard country. And I think what I missed was, is the stimulation of other people. You know, the stimulation of encountering other energies. Um, so I find it very difficult, really. Uh, but and the past week has been good. And how do you, do you think there's a way that comedians can adapt? Like there's a lot of people doing online gigs and performances. Do you feel that can ever really fully replicate doing a live stand-up show? Or do you think that's going to be the future for a lot of gigs? I, I'd have no interest in doing that. Um, uh, I'd be more interest now in going down to the main road and shouting at trucks. <laughs> I'd rather do that than do an online gig. It's, an audience, <laughs> it's a live, real audience there. Like. And, and stand outside the primary school. Assholes! You are all assholes! I'd, I'd prefer that than, uh, <laughs> than do an online gig. Um, so, so, I don't know, really. I know from reading Steve Martin's book, Born Standing Up, mm -hmm. he talks a lot about at times in his career where he felt people were coming to see him more than the set. It didn't matter about the set, they just wanted to see him. And is that something sure, that yes. you've kind of experienced or in a way that 
you know, leaning into more doing interviews or podcasts allows you to still be out there in a different way? Or what do you get different from doing that to doing stand up? Well, the thing with Steve Martin was he 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 noticed that um, he was doing shows at one stage in his career like to twenty five thousand people. He was playing like football stadiums, mm. and people were so familiar with his material that they were joining in in the punchlines and in the setups. And so he's he'd been earning millions, but that danger, mm. the, the tension of going on stage and the release when people laugh, that was gone from his. Uh, oh. from his live work so I can see how he'd get bored with that um, for me it's just uh, it's always looking for that buzz like where's the buzz mm. you know um, and uh, stand up is just is, it seems right now it seems to be relegated to some distant parish <laughs> uh, that I, I, I can't even imagine being there you know so the buzz now is and it's very different because so the way I'm talking to you is that so I'd, I'd get a thrill out of making you laugh. Okay. And then, so, so that's a kind of a performance of sorts, you know, and then when I'm talking to Hector, what I've noticed with Hector is that uh, I'm almost a submissive one. <laughs> so he does, he does most of the talk. Have you noticed that? Like he's kind of, he's the alpha male in that relationship. <laughs> so, so, and the fact that I, uh, the fact that the relationship is like that, it gives him confidence, you know? Yeah. Um, the, so it's all about the, the way the person is in front of different audiences, you know, uh, in front of a stand-up audience now, I'd be very alpha and big and strong and claiming the space. In terms of the, in the interview show, that's just another, um, I wouldn't say that's submissive, but sometimes I, I like, at, at the end of series three, I, I, I nearly became a priest, you know, when I was uh, mm. 18. Mm. And I came to the end of series three. I said, I'm going to have to change my approach here because there's a kind of a Father Tiernan vibe coming off me. It was just a little bit too <laughs> sincere and a little bit, you know, <laughs> maintaining the meaningful eye contact. And I said, oh, geez, I better loosen up here a little bit now. But it's all different and it's all looking for... I write stuff as well, you know, and I get mm. a buzz out of making myself laugh with stuff that I write. And, uh, but it's all different audiences. And I think it's all about looking for uh, connection and freedom and adrenaline. Mm. So this week, Leaving Cert's got the results and CAO offers came out today. So just wondering, do you remember the day you got your Leaving Cert results, how you felt, or what you wanted to do? Or so did any advice, sorry, for Leaving Cert's getting the results this week? Yeah, well, my advice would be say for for girls would be to get pregnant. Um, say, I think that if you didn't, if you didn't, if you didn't get your get what you wanted, you could always have a baby. I think that option is is still available for women. And uh, <laughs> I'd love to have a baby. Um, and I think uh, for fellas. I, I know I don't. I only said that to, to, to be facetious. Um, I had no interest in school, you know, and um, I, uh, so I'm not very, uh, none of my kids are particularly academic. Um, they're not, hey, 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 they're not thick now. There's <laughs> <laughs> <was> a difference. <laughs> they wouldn't be um, fiercely interested in school. I have six children altogether. Maybe the young ones are a bit, buzzed up that way but the older ones and they they did they all got amazing leaving starts but they're just not really not academic people um i'd have no real interest I, so i i'm it, i don't really like going to parent teacher meetings because i have no i'm not invested in in the process you know i'm kind of i i, I like to hear that my kids are getting on well socially um i like that they're participating in sport. I like that they're having a laugh when they're in school. I love you know, picking up my kids from school. You know, I have a daughter in secondary school in Galway and I, I love waiting for her outside the gates and she's laughing. If they're laughing coming out of school, I just think that's, that's all you, that's all you can hope for really, isn't it? You know, um, 
So one of my daughters got her leaving cert results during the week and is very happy and applied for a course and she's got it. So, um, yeah, but I, I don't, I'm not, that wouldn't be one of my strong points now. Um, advising my kids on the leaving cert and how, what to do in school. I, I hate being, Jesus, it drives me demented. Um, I have, like, one of my sons is in second class and another one of my sons is in sixth class. This helping them with their homework shit? Uh, no. I just don't do that. Find your mother. I am not getting involved with it. Not How do you do this? I don't, <laughs> I don't. I didn't. I've done. It's like going to prison and then some dwarf coming up to you and asking you, will you help me go through prison? No, I won't. You, no. So I don't, I don't do homework with them. Um, you know, Tom Waits, the musician, he mm. was on... Uh, a chat show in America and the chat show host asked him he said uh, how are the kids and he says oh it is a great gruff I said oh, uh, one, one, one of my sons is older than I am oh, oh, oh. then he goes uh, uh, I'm not allowed to help my children with their homework anymore not allowed <laughs> the host goes why not ah because they, they they came back from school one day and they said I had made up a war <laughs> <laughs> So oh, gosh. I think that's very exciting to, to, be, you know, to, to get involved with your kids' homework, but to tell lies. <laughs> Just get them into trouble. It'd be great. Oh, God. Uh, speaking of wars and rivalries, I know you're a big yeah. Liverpool supporter yourself, and yeah. Hector is a big United supporter. Are there any yeah. rivalries there during recording, or how do you feel Liverpool are looking this season? Do you think they can. Do you think they peaked last season? Well, I tell you what, he, um, he was awful cocky there for about 20 years. <laughs> he did. He told me that. He said, you weren't too cocky. You didn't brag too much about it. No, I didn't. Uh, cause I, 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 but he was awful. I remember, you know, all from about 1993 to 2012. He did the chest to be out. <laughs> You'd be doing the nav and walk. You know what I mean? <laughs> be so proud of United. Um, I actually, I'm, I'm involved with my local GAA team here. And I get, actually get more enjoyment out of that. So I'm, I've started coaching the under 12s. Um, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just waiting on the guard clearance to come through. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so I, I, I really, really enjoy that. And I get more of a buzz out of going to... I spent years going over to Anfield, you know. Um, but I, I, I realise I, I enjoy going to local GAA matches more. Um, what's your advice to the kids do you shout at them when they're playing is there any you know <laughs> yeah I'm not um, so we got this other coach in yesterday uh, who was trying to get us to stop shouting uh, I would be fairly <laughs> I'd be fairly shouting <laughs> I think I, I think it goes back to the shouting at trucks <laughs> and uh, not not having any any shows at the moment <laughs> didn't stand up for the kids <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of like a performance. It is, you know. So, um, um, but the, the coach said a great thing. He said, um, uh, what you want to introduce in order to get the... So, you might, in my mind, okay, we all want the kids to express themselves and we all love imaginative football. And he says, the way you, the way you create that is by creating chaos in the training sessions. So what you... Uh, you, you tell them all to get a bib. You don't say half you yellow, half you red. Just all get a bib. And then you throw the ball into them. You don't tell them the rules of the game or <laughs> what they're supposed to do. And you just st start. And they have no clue. So what they're doing is they, they, that helps them cope with chaos. And that helps them come up with their own kind of way of expressing themselves and trying to solve the puzzle of what the coach wants. So that stuff is fascinating to me. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah. Hector, Hector said you were big into the football cones. Said you were mad for them, putting them out for the kids. He's, oh, he's mad for cones. He's mad for, <laughs> he's mad for all that. Uh, uh, but Hector, the, the parish that Hector's connected with are do very well underage. Do you know, very well. Mm. Now, that, it hasn't translated to senior. I'll say that to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, so I'm with the under 12s. 
and I'm, I've made it, this is a long-term commitment now. I'm going to follow this team through till junior C, till they're all <laughs> in their mid-50s. <laughs> Hernias and shattered kneecaps. I'm in this, I'm hoping to get them. We want to contend for the, for the, for the, for the, for the South Galway Junior C Championship in 2041. That's my ambition. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care who knows it. <laughs> and so finally on your show and I know you do the jingle in the podcast and often on your show you'll ask your guests to give us a bit of a tune or a song is there anything you could give us a bit of a rhyme or a tune for a song just to well, sure I've, I've won Irish for you now that's quite uh, serious but mm-hmm. I have I'll, I'll throw it out to you just in case it's, it's called Fuisha Vyautza and you don't have to really understand it um it's uh, by a poet from the Iron Islands called Marcino Diron, and it goes something like this. Fuisha viaudsa, shal bug gara the mask muglina e ilon mara eg shul kush clada modernist tranona o loon gasatan hirig baile. Fuisha viaudsa, shal bug gara e mask muglina o cre crua o uignus dur. O Wurch Agna, O Kainch Rontoch, here Egbalje. And that's it. So that, that's a poem about a fella who uh, wants to be walking along a beach in the west of Ireland uh, amongst people he can call friends. So that's. And that will be the chant for the under 12s now when you win the championship. Fuisha <laughs> Vyautza! Fuisha Vyautza! <laughs> Tommy, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and the best of luck with the rest of the podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks, Justine. Thank you.